So this video picks up at the very bottom of page 63 in my copy. We are midway through the long-awaited final confrontation between Torvald and Nora, in which we will start to see um, now their marriage, if it wasn't unravelling before, now it's definitely starting to unravel. Now faced with the prospect of the public humiliation, uh, or the ridicule, or the loss of reputation that Torvald believes that he faces, he now has promised Nora, or has suggested this idea of a sham marriage only, that they stay together, but only for the sake of appearances. We were interrupted by a ring at the doorbell. Who knows what this will be? Helmer, shocked because by now it's late into the night, starts and says, what is that? So late? Can the worst? Can he? Hide yourself, Nora. Say you are ill. In his selfishness, the only thing that uh, he can think is that Klogstad has somehow come to blackmail them. Nora stands motionless. Notice that in not hiding and not pandering to Torvald's paranoia, she now looks increasingly like the brave and the noble character here. She stands motionless. Elma goes and unlocks the hall door. Again, the con notice the cost of presence of him with the key and the one who has the capacity to control the door. The one who is, as it were, imprisoning her. The maid, half-dressed, comes to the door and says, A letter for the mistress. And Helmer can only say, and rudely you might notice, Give it to me. And he takes the letter and shuts the door again. Yes, it is from him. You shall not have it. I will read it myself. Nora replies, Yes, read it. He stands by the lamp and says, I scarcely have the courage to do it. It may mean ruin for both of us. No, I must know. Again, notice, he's the one talking about hiding. He's the one with a lack of courage. Nora, in a sense, and almost behind the scenes, has been the one running this marriage, it, we now increasingly realise. And he is the one who is increasingly lost, uh, now that he thinks that he's been forced into acting. So... He tears open the letter, runs his eye over a few lines, looks at a paper enclosed, and gives a shout of joy. Nora! She looks at him questioningly. Nora, no, I must read it once again. Yes, it is true. I am saved. Nora, I am saved. Look at it again. I am saved. And just in case we didn't get it once, we get it twice. I am saved. What does he care about? Himself his reputation only. Nora's plainly aware of this because she answers him, and I? He's forgotten her and her well-being entirely. He replies, you too, of course. As if it should be taken for granted, but of course it isn't. And we've seen enough in the preceding lines and the preceding pages to realise that that's not the case. So he goes on. You too, of course. We are both saved. Both you and I. Look, he sends you your bond back. He says he regrets and repents that a happy change in his life. Well, never mind what he says. We are saved, Nora. No one can do anything to you. So, let's think about this. If there is any prospect of him being saved, it is only because partly of the actions of Nora, but even more of the actions of Mrs. Linde. And we said earlier, didn't we, if we're talking about the status of lower class or working class characters in this play, um, it's interesting how many of them just make these silent accommodations around the margins of the Helmers' lives in order to sort of facilitate that their lives can go on as normal. We've seen it with Anne, the, um, the sort of nursemaid, come governess woman. We've seen it with Mrs. Lind, and even with Krogstad too. So, um, we have it here then. Um, he thinks somehow that this is all going to go away. We'll see what more about what how Nora reacts in a moment. 
So he says, oh, Nora, Nora, no, first I must destroy these hateful things. Let me see. He takes a look at the bond. No, no, I won't look at it. The whole thing shall be nothing but a bad dream to me. He tears up both the bond and letters, throws them all into the stove, and watches them burn. There, now, it doesn't exist any longer. He says that since Christmas Eve, you... These must have been three dreadful days for you, Nora. Now, suddenly now, he is trying to be conciliatory once again. Suddenly now, he is seemingly attempting to uh, be nice to her, as if to suggest that somehow their marriage could just go back to what it was all along. But the genie's out of the bottle. She's seen his true colours now. She's seen what he really cares about more than he cares about her. And so we'll see how she responds. Nora says, I have fought a hard fight these three days. Again, still these simple, single-line utterances from Nora. The quiet strength and power that she demonstrates here, still in the face of Torvald and all of his bluster. And look at the metaphor, this fight that she's fought. Not a womanly thing to expect, but it emphasises, doesn't it, Nora's strength as a character, of a strength of mind, and the way in which she is actually the more courageous character, as we previously said, certainly, than her husband. He goes on to say, and suffered agonies, and seen no way out, but no, we won't call any of the horrors to mind. We will only shout with joy and keep saying, it's all over, it's all over. Listen to me, Nora, you don't seem to realise that it's all over. Now, we said in the previous section that it seemed set for a tragic ending. We have another twist for a second here. Suddenly it looks like there's been a last minute saviour. It looks like um, there could be a happy ending after all. But Ibsen is just playing with us. That's not what he wants. He doesn't want us to be left with this neat happy ending that we can just go away from without questioning anything about the way that society is organised or managed or run. And so we go on then. He says you don't seem to realise that it's all over. He thinks perhaps that she's shocked into not um, celebrating. And he says, what is this? Such a cold, set face? Because she knows now. She knows what she must do. She knows that she can't possibly stay with a man like Torvald in a situation like this. She, she can't do it for herself. And look what he says. My poor little Nora, I quite understand. You don't feel as if you could believe that I have forgiven you. But it is true, Nora. I swear it. I have forgiven you everything. I know that what you did, you did out of love for me. Now this should be a happy ending. In a well-made play it would be. Nora replies, still so simply, almost understatedly, that is true. We know it's true, he now knows it's true. But she also knows that it's not enough. He goes on and says, you have loved me as a wife ought to love her husband. Only you had not sufficient knowledge to judge of the means you used. Still, he talks about her being silly a page or two ago. He's now implying again that she is stupid in the face of all of this. As if somehow she could have committed that crime out of mere carelessness or frivolousness. He thinks that he's trying to win back her affections, not realising that every word now that he says is only going to make her more certain. So, he says then, Do you suppose you are any the less dear to me because you don't understand how to act on your own responsibility? That, not understanding how to act. No, no, just lean on me. I will advise you and direct you. Lean on me. He still thinks, as he seemed to think at the beginning of the play, that in a way he is the dominating character and that she leans on him without realising that, you know, perhaps more even than just in this one case, 
It's been the work of Nora behind the scenes that has actually allowed his marriage to survive in any sense. So, I will advise you and direct you, he says. I shouldn't be a man if this womanly helplessness did not give you a double attractiveness in my eyes. What? This womanly helplessness? It's like saying that she throws like a girl. It's ridiculous here. The, the sentiments that he expresses. Um, he thinks that she's attractive because she's so useless. Still, he doesn't get it. And still, any woman with any self-respect has only got one choice, I think, now. He goes on. You mustn't think any more about the hard things I said in my first moment of consternation when I thought everything was going to overwhelm me. Notice, I thought, overwhelm me, still thinking about himself. I have forgiven you, Nora. I swear to you, I have forgiven you. Of course, the real question here is, can she do the same? So simply, once again, she replies, thank you for your forgiveness and she goes out to the door to the right no don't go and he looks in what are you doing in there and from within she calls out she is taking off my fancy dress isn't it interesting that this fancy dress this sort of ultimate symbol of her being objectified actually has been worn throughout this section it's a sort of an increasingly hollow reminder of the role that she played. The fact that she's taking it off is very significant because it tells us symbolically what we're already starting to realise, that it's a role that she is not willing to play any more. If she takes that off, she will never simply be his little bird again. He stands at the open door and watches her do it. Yes, do. Try and calm yourself and make your mind easy again, my frightened little singing bird. Relax and feel secure. I have broad wings to shelter you under. He walks up and down by the door. Apart from the irony of it, he's completely oblivious to the fact that she doesn't want to shelter anymore. She doesn't want to depend on him or perhaps on any man doesn't want to feel like a possession like this ever again. He continues, how warm and cosy our home is, Nora, referring of course back to the image of the doll's house, the perfect idealised 19th century middle class home that this play began with. He goes on, here is shelter for you, here I will protect you like a hunted dove that I have saved from a hawk's claws, I will bring, bring peace to your poor beating heart. Look at it. He's talking to her as if he is the one who has saved the day. He will protect you as if he has saved her. And yet actually, Nora saved him. She saved him again through getting Mrs. Lynn to talk to him. And of course it's Mrs. Lynn's sacrifice with Krogstad, whatever you think about that, that has saved Torvald here. Nothing to do with any of his own actions. He really is suffering from a terrible case of self delusion. So, what does he say then? He can't say it. It will come little by little, Nora, believe me. Tomorrow morning you will look upon it all quite differently. Soon everything will be just as it was before. Very soon you won't need me to assure you that I have forgiven you. You will yourself feel the certainty that I have done so. Still doesn't get it. Still doesn't see. She never can. But he goes on. Do you imagine I should ever think of such a thing as repudiating you, or even reproaching you? He's trying now, almost gaslighting, we might say in a modern context, he's trying to claim that he never meant any of it, that he would never ha have uh, actually um, really meant it, he would never have done what he just said. And yet we can very much see as an audience that what he said there in anger were his true um, thoughts and revealed his true self. He returns to attacking her on the theme of her ignorance, saying, You have no idea what a true man's heart is like, Nora. Well, if he's anything to go by, certainly not, because he's no true man, so there's an irony for us. 
but he goes on. There is something so indescribably sweet and satisfying to a man in the knowledge that he has forgiven his wife, forgiven her freely and with all his heart. The self-congratulating imbecile, I can't hop into, into adding in at this point, he has given her a new life, so to speak, and she has in a way become both wife and child to him. Both wife and child, I mean, that's a good quotation. It sums up the nature of his view of the relationship all the way through and of her actions early on. But what this demonstrates, this whole section, is that there is only one child here and it is absolutely emphatically not Nora. But all the emphasis that he has forgiven her, um, he has given her a new life, um, as if he is some sort of god in the household even. It's absolutely disgusting from a modern point of view and it makes your skin crawl, I think, just looking at it. But he goes on. So you shall be for me after this, my little scared, helpless darling. Have no anxiety about anything, Nora. Just be frank and open with me, and I will serve as will and conscience both to you. And he breaks off. He will serve as will and conscience, as if she has no mind of her own. Dreadful. But he's surprised. He thinks that, after having undressed, that she would be going to bed, and he says, What is this? Not gone to bed? Have you changed your things? And she now appears in everyday dress, rather than, of course, the fancy dress, and says, Yes, Torvald, I have changed my things now. But what for? As late as this? I shan't sleep tonight. But, my dear Nora, and she looks at her watch, it is not so very late. Sit down here, Torvald. You and I have a lot to say to one another. And she sits down at one side of the table. Now, all through this exchange, we've had this immensely one-sided scene where it's all been Torvald and it's all been his thoughts, his feelings, his reputation, his cares and concerns. We're now about to see a reversal. We're about to see how things look from Nora's side going to be damning. We said structurally that this play ends with a discussion and that's what it is. This is a play that is not telling us simply what to think but it shows us what a marriage looks like and by discussing now this situation it allows we as an audience to understand these factors and come to our own judgments. At that point then, on the final line of page 65, we will conclude this video and in the next one we will pick up Nora's side of the story.